I want you to pray right now, silently. You can pray out loud, I don't care, it's not me. I want you to, I want you to ask the Spirit of the living God who lives with inside of you, who helps us make sense of the Scriptures, ask Him to do that for you tonight. Ask Him to take it and make it new and fresh in your mind. I'm going to do the same, and then we're going to pray and jump into it. Father, we need your night. We, we need your, your spirit who resides within those of us who are believers in Christ. And, and you, you illumine the truth. You, you make it make sense to us. You, you guide us in it. You lead us into this truth. And I'm asking that you would do this tonight. I'm asking that we would be different because we've spent some time here looking at some things that are timeless. And that, Father, you would have your way in our life and you would stir us and you would encourage us and you would move us to be the people that you have called us to be. And so tonight, Father, we submit to the presence of the Holy Spirit. We ask that as we open up this sacred text, that you would speak to us and that you would transform us by it. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Man, in my younger days, um, I had this fetish for caving, spelunking, and mountain climbing, and, and all of those things. And, and uh, this was I mean, maybe you were supposed to have waivers and everything. I didn't, I didn't even know what a waiver was. I was just a 21-year-old kid who loved doing those things. And I would pack our little station wagon with uh, however many kids wanted to go with me. And we'd go to Porto Madrid. If you're not from Birmingham, you won't know where that is. But it's right near Gate City, which is one of the, uh, the housing projects. It's one of the more dangerous ones. And we would park across the road from a Porto. And I would take these uh, eight or so kids and we'd you know, dark traffic and run across the road and there was a billboard there and then we would make our way up the hillside of that billboard to what was kind of like a logging road in what's known as Red Mountain. So at the top of Red Mountain, uh, when you got to a certain point, I would go a, a right and it would be about six steps and then I would go about four steps up and there would be a hole in the ground about like this. And I had my, I had my rope and I'd tell my kids, hey, this is where we're going. Man, they were looking at me like, what, you're out of your mind. And uh, so I threw that rope down in there, and I tossed one of the kids that looked like I could push, and I pushed him down in there, and, and we'd drop down about eight feet. And then we would slither a little bit, and we'd drop down about six more feet, and we were in a cavern about as big as this on Red Mountain. Now, they have mines there, but this isn't a mine shaft. This is an actual cave. And so we would take the kids, and we would, we would just snake our way all the way to the very back of it. There was this incredible natural slide uh, that, that we could that we would do and we would slide down into this other section and we'd turn all the flashlights off. It is the darkest place and if, if you've never been in a cave where you can't see anything, it is the darkest place that you will ever be. You can't see a hand in front of you. And so we would talk about kind of what we're going to talk about here. But then I would do this. I, I would look, and I, I mean, I didn't let them know that this is what it was, but I would look at the kid that I thought was the outcast, the one that everybody was like, I don't even know why he's here. I would take up all the flashlights, and I would give the one flashlight to him. We'll call him Danny. That mean Danny may or may not have been a real guy. But, but so, so I would give that flashlight to Danny, and I would say, now, Danny, you're going to lead us out. Man, all the kids. I mean, you, it was the loudest place in the world because all these kids are going, you're out of your mind, Danny. It was just crazy. But it was, what was amazing was how close they wanted to stay next to Danny because nobody, because I didn't tell you there was a little, little chasm that I would have to straddle and help kids across. And, and so if you didn't know where that was, we might have lost Carol down in there. Uh, it was about a, I don't know, about a 15 foot drop. And so there was a time when she did that because we were both muddy from the climb. And, and so when I was moving her, she just slid down me and I couldn't hold on to her. And so my brother and I, he kind of, we yule human chain and pulled her out. And it's a whole, that's a whole sidebar. But anyway. That, so the kids know this, and so they got they're, they're, hub, they're like hanging on to this one guy with the flashlight until we get all the way out. And I'll never forget what happens as we talk about that. How listen, I mean, this guy became the most popular guy immediately in the group, all because he had the light. That was it. He had the flashlight. That was it. And I, I think about that, and I realize that. If you and me have the light of God's word, we're the most we're the most popular person around. We're, 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 we're the, we are certainly 
the most valuable person around if we are the one who does that. Go somewhere where it's dark and start just start speaking the name of Jesus and start loving people like it, it's insane. The guy that taught me how to cave, Andy, uh, who's man been in ministry forever. There was a group called Campus Life in Birmingham in those days, and he was not a believer, but Joe the leader was. And Andy said that we made it our mission. We'd invite him to come play football with us, and we would just drill him. And uh, he, they said he kept coming back. It was so frustrating. We were trying to run him off. He kept coming back. And finally, they were like, why are you doing this? He said, because I love you guys. And it transformed Andy McDaniel's life. And Andy McDaniel became one of the greatest men in, the, in that area of campus life. He worked all over the Southeast. Today, he's uh, about maybe six weeks or so from being with Jesus, but, uh, but, a, but a dear friend. And I'm telling you, it is because, he, listen, he didn't know the theology that, that a lot of guys knew, but he knew the love of Christ and he shared it. And so here's what I want us to understand, that we become the most dangerous people in the world when we are a force that understands the Word of God and lives out the Word of God without all the fanfare. And so this is where we're going. And this is what I want us to understand. There were three things that were lost in the fall. Now, when we say fall, I don't mean the fall like in the weather. I mean the fall like when Adam and Eve were, were in the garden, everything was perfect, and God had finished creating everything, and he said, and it was very good. And the serpent sl walks in, he slithers out, but he walks in, and, and he begins to tempt them. And, and so we, we, we know what happens. We, we know that if the day that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, that you're going to die. And so what happened when they ate of that tree, they had an awareness not just of what was holy, but what was evil. And that thing in itself, as it tempted them toward that, brought a darkness that McKinley read about a minute ago, and, and, it, and it's a dark darkness. And then he said, in the day you eat, you die. Well, they didn't physically die, but their body began to break down. And the, the, the relationship, see, your sin makes a separation between you and God. And so when that happens, there's life is severed. And so, so they lost life. They were, they were just, at this point now, going through motion. And then, and then, it says that they, do you remember when it says that they were naked and not ashamed? And then it, they ate and they were naked and they knew it and they hid themselves. That's when self-absorption, that's when selfishness began to take over. Do you, you know what happened when they did that? Remember? God's like, hey man, who, what, who, who told you you were naked? Immediately, he threw his wife under the bus, right? Yeah, it was the woman. He, look, he looks at her. And she goes, it was that serpent, right? And so what has happened since the fall is that we do nothing now but hide our flaws and hurl accusations at others. Go check it out. Go see everybody. See what happens. That's what we do. So we lost three things at the fall. We, we lost light, we lost life, and we lost love. And so it's almost like a portal was opened up. You guys watch those sci-fi dystopian type movies, right? Where there's this, and it was almost like this portal opened up and, and darkness just began to creep in everywhere. And it didn't take that long because it, their, their children, Cain and Abel, sin was crouching at the door waiting to have its way with, with Cain. And he, he killed his brother. And then 10 generations later, we get to Noah. And here's what God says about that generation. He said, I'm sorry that I made man. He said, everywhere I look, it's evil. Always, only, continuously. Think about how that, think about how he says that. Always, only, continuously. That's all it is. It's just this darkness. Now Solomon says it like this in Proverbs 4. He says, the way of the wicked is like darkness. And they don't know over what they stumble. This is the picture of the world. And you can hang with me because we're, we're, we're moving somewhere. And, and Isaiah, Isaiah says it like this in 520. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. So it's just this dark place and it's evil. 
This is the story of the Old Testament, though. This is the story of God who takes a group of people who are in darkness and rebellion, and He is gracious, and He's loving, and He's patient. But man keeps choosing themselves constantly. And it's just dark everywhere. The Old Testament story is the story of, of God's grace in the midst of this colossal selfishness. Now, we get to the text that we're looking at, and he says this. In, so, so God's answer in the midst of all of that, he, listen, he gave them the commandments and they didn't want to keep it. They didn't like it. They, they, they wanted darkness, right? And, and, and he, he showed them all of the things, but, but they didn't like it. And so here's what it says. God's answer is this. I am going to bring the light of truth embodied in Christ and He's going to walk the planet. And so this is where we go. And this is what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the reality of what God did. He brought light to a dark world. The same God who created and is the author of everything walked into this world as a bright light. But we read, or McKinley did, uh, that about what John saw, and it says this, the true light that gives life to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children, not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Now, when Jesus gets to Nicodemus, Remember the story of Nicodemus who came to him at night. This is, this is how Jesus describes it himself. And I want us to grab this. For God so, you know this verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they had not believed in the name of God's only Son. This is the verdict. So God looks at this and goes, this is the verdict. Here, here I am, and here's what he says. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Now, just look around, right? There's a darkness that's everywhere. There's self-absorption. There's death. You, you see zombies walking around. People just addicted. I, I see it all the time. They're just they're 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 going through motion. Look at around in the darkness that's going on. I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are people who actually think there's more than two genders. I, I don't understand that, but they think that, right? And so we see all of this evil that that's going on. This darkness. This is why Christ came, to give us life. This is why you're here, to give us life. Now, John says that he is light, but he's also the Word. And so I want us to understand something, that this book that we hold right here, this is light. Everything that's troubling the world right now, the answer to it is found in the pages of this book. Let me turn it the right way. It is in the, in the pages of this book. Everything in here is. It's important that we know that. This, this book, the, are you keeping up with what's going on in the world? They think this is like a bunch of junk. They think it's made up. They think that it's not true. But I would tell you that a lot of them are just ignorant about what's going on. This, the book that she read out of, John, do you, do you know we can find the manuscript of that? Uh, it was found in, in Sinai Peninsula. Almost perfect in the way it looks. And it's, it's in a university in London, England. You can go and look at it. And it's there. 
Now, it's about 125 years away. Well, then, well where's the original? Well, we did find one that's 25 years, uh, and it's also in, in England. Uh, and so that's only, that's just very little bit away. Now, I realize, you're, why are we talking about this? Here, just hang with me. People want to know where are the original manuscripts. Well, there, there's about eight different areas. They're called codex. They're, they're different groups of where they are. You can go find almost everything. And you know what we know about this? We, we know that there are some where the, the copies were, were uh, mislabeled here and there, but we know where every one of them is. In, in all the scriptures, we know where they are. We know where the mistakes are, where some scribe messed up a word. We, we know that. What I want to do is just give you a taste of the fact that this book that we hold in our hands is reliable. There is ancient texts that show this. Now, where are the originals? It was a little thing called a persecution that was taking place when these letters were being written. And the Domitian was on a rant and he was on a tear and he made Nero look like, you know, kind of a choir boy. And in the middle of all of that, the church is scattered. And, and it's like if you've ever had a house fire or you ever had to run and you left everything, that's what happened. So, so it's no mystery. Don't, don't let people confuse you with all of these things. Here's what we know. We know that this book, over 40 different authors, 1,500 different years, and three different continents, put this thing together. you know that when Jesus was alive, the Old Testament was called the Scriptures? Looks just like what you have in your Bible today, except that instead of having First and Second Chronicles, it was just Chronicles. And so here's what I want us to understand about this book. It's powerful. It's living. And it's active. And in it resonates with the Word of God. You prayed a prayer before we started that the Spirit of Christ would help you understand what's going on here. Have you ever read the Scriptures in such a way that it grabbed you and you didn't know, you didn't even know what was going on, that it was transforming to? Have you ever had that experience? I pray you have. I pray that you've read the Word and realized that was, God, it's, it's life-changing. And so this is, this is what we're going to, when we talk about culture, it's time out here thinking of kind of a sermon, kind of not a sermon. This is just me ranting. I, this is more really, this is what I do, right? But listen, we will passionately pursue truth here. This is what we're going to do. We, here's the only question we have to ask ourselves. Not what do we want this to say. This, I ask this question all the time. I got guys all the time, well, I don't believe you're right. Okay, well, you tell me what do you want it to say? Because here's the answer. I want it to say what it says. Do you? And if we purposely study the Word, we're going to know what it says. And we're going to passionally pursue that. And we're to, that two, two weeks from now. I love how we're doing church. Like, when, I don't know where it went. Whenever we get together again, um, we're going to look at life. That's the Spirit of Christ. When you take the Word of Christ and the Spirit of Christ and you join those things together, there is the, it is the most powerful force on the known planet. And so nothing replaces this light. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do over the next two weeks since we're going to be together. Pick some place in this book and read it. Listen, this book is better than any devotion. I, I know everybody loves devotions and podcasts and all that. Could you and me take a time out from that? Maybe could we take a time out from listening to Tony Robbins? I know he's got some great stuff, or Brene Brown, or whoever it is you want to listen to. Can we take a break from all that and just open up the pure word and see what it says? Because if we'll do the hard work, it's, it's transformative in what it does. Let me help you see a few things of how I do this. It's what I call truisms. So I was reading Romans 8.28 as I was studying through that text. And it said, do you know this verse? All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Right? We, we, we know that. All things. All. Not a hard word. It means all. Right? That means God's going to take all things. Doesn't mean He causes all things. It didn't say He caused all things. But listen, nothing comes into your life that hasn't been sifted through His hands. Are we tracking here? All right. All things work together for good to who? To those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. You know what I hear from that? Every deficit that comes into my life, God's going to turn into an asset. Now that's how I see that text. Deficits to assets. So, January 3rd, I'm at Tracery Stone. I'm going to help my guys out. I'm going to go do a little inventory. And so, 
I mean, I'm a not an I'm not a non-coordinated guy. I'm a fairly coordinated guy. I, I could be old, but I'm coordinated. I don't want you. I don't want you to think, well, you old stumbling man, just out of you know, he shouldn't have been out there. And so there's a pallet there, and there's a stone. You've heard me tell this. 542 pounds. I know because I, I actually was kind of guessing when I was sitting out there when it's laying on me. That, but that's a whole other story in and of itself. So. I step on this pallet, and it looks like it's tight and right, but it's not, and so it's cantilevered just a little bit. And so that stone slams down here and then flattens me. And so when I look, my ankle is laying flat against the, God's earth, and my knee is up in the air. And I'm like, that doesn't really look like it. So I'm trying to lower my knee down. I'm thinking, man, if I could pull my leg out, and then I thought, I could leave it in there, and that would be really bad. These are the thoughts. You, ever, you know when you're ever in a situation, you ever have thoughts like that? And so if I go to these thoughts, I'm like, maybe I should call Chase before I could pass out. I don't know. I don't feel like it, but you don't know. And so I call my buddy Chase. And I say, hey, man, can you come out here? I think I've, I need your help. And so he comes running out there because I said the Moscato area, and he knew exactly where it was. And so he and I together lift that stone off. And as we slide my foot out, it just flops. And I knew then that this, this was really bad. And so he's almost you know gagging because he's trying to hold my leg together and he's like that is the weirdest thing and so we lay it flat and I say we probably ought to call here take my phone and call 911 so he does and they come yeah in all of that I'm telling you this before he ever came out there this truth came to my mind God will turn this into an asset I'm, I'm not I'm not making that stuff up I'm telling you and here's something that Tammy and I talk about all the time we study truth in the light so that we can walk in the darkness, right? Hard times will come. And if you don't prepare and you don't study the Word of God and you don't know it and you don't have truisms, you don't that, that you know are yours, when you get to that place, you're going to freak out and you're going to act like the rest of the world. And I'm not the rest of the world. I'm a child of God. And God caused all things to work together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And I sat there and I told Chase, God's going to do something good with this. And they threw me in the deal, and then all that happened, and I'm here today, and i got three more weeks before I can walk. There's been some really good things. Do you know what I was preaching the Sunday before that happened? I was, it, was, it was a New Year's message, and I was preaching on moments, that I'm going to be in the moment this year. Because I always, I'm that guy, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm looking at the next thing. And then I realized, you know what God just did? He slapped me upside the head and said, oh, you want moments? Yeah, here you go. You can't move. How you like that, big boy? And you know what I realized? It's an asset. Come on. There have been some things that have gone on in mine and Tammy's life because of this. And we just sit and we chat and I'm hurting and she's serving me. And, and I don't want to be served. I'm not that guy. I don't know if your husband is that way. If I'm sick, I'm not, I, I'm not that guy. I, leave me alone. And she gets mad. And, and so we've had those conversations. I think I've shared that with you. But here's what I want you to understand. I'm watching right now, real time, what God's doing. He is doing exactly what that word said, and I believe it. Kevin is here, and he's here tonight. And, and Kevin is here because God knew that this was going to happen and that, that I was going to be fast-tracked out of being director of operations, which I am not that good. And the more I sit with Kevin, the more I realize, man, I am like a loser. Because Kevin is just brilliant when it comes to that. And, and, but, but that was never my assigned role anyway. It was always that I'm going to be a culture officer, right? To where, where I can create leadership and, and do. And I want, Trevor called, hey, we're going to fast track that. I'm like, yeah, because that's a deficit to an asset. You know, and I'm like, come on, right? And I'm excited about what's happening. Now, I, I want you to hear this. And I want you to understand this. This is how we have to see truth. This is, this is how it's done, Right? So I have a phrase that I think Trevor mentioned a few weeks ago. I have a lot to think about, but I've got nothing to worry about. Come on. You know where that comes from? The Word of God. Jesus says, be anxious for nothing. Well, Paul says that. Jesus says, don't be anxious. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. But Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. In the peace of God, What's your pastor comprehension? And I realize this. If God has an entrance date for me and an end date for me and purpose in the middle, why, why, am, I, why am I worried? Man, Tammy used to have this worry thing going on. And I would always, listen, every time I went on a mission trip, something crazy happened, and I won't bore you with all the stories, but it's like it's, like it's just game on and Satan's just attacking. And I would tell her this constantly. 
because she would worry about me. And I, I got caught. <laughs> my first trip out of the country was in to Belize. We were going uh, we to st- establish a church on the island, which is one of my favorite things to do. And Hurricane Mitch came at that very time. And I called her and I said, look, I'm not sure we're going to get out of here. Hurricane Mitch was a five. They said if it, had, if it could have been anything, it would have been an eight on a scale. And it's coming right at us. And it was crazy. And so I'm, this was my, hey, I love you. I may not see you again. Uh, tell the kids I said, hey. And, and so then I'm doing this thing. But, but here's, here's what I would tell her every time I left. I am invincible until God says otherwise. Right? Do you believe that about yourself? Come on. See, here, here's the problem with the world. And, and this is the problem with the church and the world. I don't even know how long I'm preaching or whatever. It doesn't matter, does it? Y'all, we're going to go in there. It's raining. Uh, there is very little difference between churchgoers and the world when it comes to anxiety and addiction and medication. Same thing in the issue of, of marriage, divorce. There's, there's no difference. You know why? Because we may know the Bible. We don't believe the Bible. And so what I want us to understand is that a part of this church is going to be that we're going to take this book seriously. We're going to be good students of it. We're not going to make it say what we want it to say. We're not going to just pass on some shoddy preacher's idea of it because it got emotion and got people somewhere. Listen, we're going to, we're going to speak truth to one another because this is what the Scripture says we're going to do. And so a part of the culture here is we're going to let this book say what it says. We're going to unleash it, and we're going to believe it. Not know it, but believe it, right? And so I don't have anything to worry about. I don't. I, I, you don't have anything. You choose to worry, but you don't have to. That's why, and I think Larry mentioned it the other day, I would always tell my kids when I'm going to start freaking out about something, I'd just go, come on, let's hold hands and worry, right? Because what does that fix? Nothing. But you know what does fix it? Being grateful casting my cares on him because he cares for me. And I said, Lord, I need you to fix this. Now, he doesn't always do what we want him to. See, here's good theology three Hebrew children gave to us. When, when the king said, hey, you're going to bow down. If you don't, I'm going to throw you in that fire. They go, hey, we ain't bowing down. Oh, oh, you will. Uh, no, we ain't bowing down. Our God is able to deliver us. Now, that's a powerful phrase. Come on. But they also had a realism, but even if he doesn't, why? Because they know that he may or he may not. See, we always assume, well, God's gonna, God's gonna, God wants me happy. Really? I'm not saying he doesn't, but he doesn't say it. Right? And so I may, listen, here's a statistic. Nobody gets out of here alive, right? I mean, we all die. Uh, and, and so the reality is the theology was right. Hey, God's going to deliver us. And if by chance he doesn't, we still ain't bowing down. This is what it means to take the word and believe it and walk it out. And this is what I want to see happen here. I I want us to to raise our children this way. I I want us to to have our marriage. Listen, your marriage can be fixed, right? It, It can be fixed. Your children can come home. Now, I'm not saying you can do anything about it, but we do know that God is able, and we do know that there are certain things that we ought to do and we can do. I could ask you this question and we could finish You know right now there's something that you ought to stop doing, but you won't do it. All of us have that. We all have that. And we know that God doesn't want us doing it, but we like it. But if you stopped it, your life would change. Do you believe that? And then there's something you know you ought to start doing, and you don't want to. Because it may mean you got to put pride down. It may mean you have to admit that you weren't right, right? But if you did that, if you started doing something, it'd be a game changer. See this? So this is this is what I want us to understand. And I'm gonna. I could man. I could keep talking. I got thousands of things to say. But I want us to hear this. This book is powerful. I will tell you this real quick because uh, my Abby was mentioning it to me last night. Tammy's uh, sister Gina, she's five years younger than Tammy. She's got cancer, ovarian cancer, and she got the news. It was, uh, you know, rocking to all of us because like that's just crazy. And so we watched her walk this thing out. Now we all know Gina, those of us who know her, that she's a good girl. She's like Tammy. She's just a good girl. Tammy's always been a good girl. 
That's been her problem. She's a good girl. She she wasn't sure if she was saved because she's just good, you know, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was one of those where she started doubting. So her sister was just like it. So when she got, you know, when you hear the, the word cancer on the phone and they're telling you have it, I can't imagine what that's like. Some of you may have experienced that. She was telling Abby, my, uh, my daughter, she said, I'd always, just in the back of my mind, always doubted whether I was a believer or not. But she said, when I got that word, and this peace came over me that I couldn't expect, and it's still there, I knew that I'm a, I'm a child of God, because that's what the Bible says. And I just love that story about what's going on there. So, listen, now we're going to be done here. Come back in two weeks. We're going we're gonna to tie the Holy Spirit into this and we're going to see what's going on. <clears throat> and so, but here's what I, I got two or three things I want you to do. Read this word. Pick a book. Don't look at a devotion about it. Don't. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I, I write devotions. I'd love for you to, you know, but, but no, I, I want you to just open it up and pray that simple prayer. God, speak to me as I read this text. See what happens. All right? Every day, do that. I pick, I don't, it don't matter where you go. Just do it. It's going to be life-changing for you. I know we used to joke about guys would do this. You know what? But I've done that before. I've been in the stone yard before, hiding out. This before Trevor got here. Uh, <laughs> hiding out, reading the Word of God because I was at a low point, and I would just read until, no, I don't like that one. No, I don't like Oh, that's a good one. Right? But it's amazing what would happen is I just wandered through the Psalms. And so here's what I'm asking you to do. Just do that. Second thing. Stop doing that thing that you know you ought to stop doing. You know what it is. We could say it all out loud and all of us have something different, but you know what it is. Stop doing that. And then you know the thing that you should start doing that would change your life. Like maybe forgiving, maybe loving, maybe whatever. I don't know what that is for you. I'm not trying to project that. I'm just telling you whatever that is. And let's see what God does in the next two weeks. I believe it's going to be life-changing.